All right, welcome everyone to our Killer Presentations Crash Course presented by Runway Innovation Hub. My name is Manny Oriana and I am the Head of Events and Online Learning here at Runway. Runway is a San Francisco-based innovation hub and we provide workspace, corporate innovation, and event services to a global community of tech startups and enterprise. We are focused on curating and engaging with a community of tech startups, people, and organizations who want to work with or support tech startups. That can be corporates, service providers, government agencies, a whole mix. As for today's format, we'll do a 40 minute talk followed by a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. Uh, feel free to add any questions to the Q&A feature of this platform and we'll do our best to answer the questions in real time. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Clemence Lepper, and she'll give you a course on how to make solid presentations and review actionable strategies and techniques on how to get there. Clemence is head of marketing at Runway, born in France. She has lived over eight years in China, where she evolved in a variety of roles, marketing, innovation, sales, environments, MNCs, startups, and consulting. She moved to California in 2018 and is based in SF. And on a personal note, she loves surfing and eating lobsters, among other things. Now, without any further ado, Clemence, take it away. Thank you, Manny. That's a great intro. Hi, everyone. Super happy to uh, see you here um, during our online killer presentation course. We do have a couple of things together uh, that we're going to cover. Uh, so stay comfortable, grab a cup of coffee, a glass of water or something maybe a bit more fancy. We're going to be uh, reviewing three things today that are important uh, for making better presentations. The first is getting the foundations right. Everything from having a goal to identifying your presentation type to crafting your message and basically breaking it down in your presentation. The second thing is tips, mindset and frameworks you can use for making better slides. We'll go over essential mindset and also a bit more advanced. And the last part of our presentation will be about how do you deliver actually a good presentation? How do you make that happen? So um, let's do it. Plan. Uh, plan is everything you need to be doing before starting to design any slide. It's important because if you get it right, the rest will come much more easily. So what I mentioned earlier is we're gonna get the foundations right. First, I'll walk you through the different things you need to do and the question you need to ask yourself to get started of the right foot. So we'll go over how to set up a goal for your presentation, how to identify your presentation type, how to be centered on your audience because it's about them, not about you. And also a different way to structure your presentation for maximum impact. Usually to make a presentation, there's a very simple process you can use. That's the one I use. Um, usually I get started with defining why am I doing my presentation. Then I go across what is the key message I want to communicate to my audience. How can I develop an outline and structure around that message based on my goal. Then um, I'll gather all the piece of information I need to support my message, my smaller message and reach my goal. And once this is done, I will consolidate all the elements and design the deck. So it's a simple process. If you use it and follow it methodically, it can help you save a lot of time. The first thing you should get started by doing is probably identify your presentation type because we do a presentation for many different purposes. We do them to inform people. For instance, you're making a sales presentation, you're making a deck to your board members, um, you're educating a client on a solution that they've already uh, hired. Another style is educate people. For instance, if we take a look at this presentation, it's mostly an educational uh, focused presentation because this is a presentation where you're gonna learn tricks and tips to make better presentations. So it's focused on education. Another type of presentation is persuade, persuasion oriented. So basically, whenever you're doing an investor pitch deck, whenever you're making um, a presentation to demo a product to clients, you're trying to get them to do something, to get a proposal from you, to agree to get a proposal from you, or to subscribe to a solution. So a presentation could fall into different buckets at the same time, but usually there's one focus. So when you get started, try to identify the focus of your presentation. 
A second thing that's important for you to get started with is to focus on your audience. People who understand their audience are more successful in getting to their communication goals. Why? Well, because you craft your message around the specifics of your audience. So you need to identify basically who you're talking to. And there's three ways you can do that. The first is understand demographics and psychographics of your audience. By demographics, I'm talking about age, gender, geography, income. The more granular you can be, the better it is. Psychographics are stuff like values, opinions, things people like that characterize more who they are basically and which pattern you can identify. Once you do have those pieces of information, you can focus more on people's hopes, fears, and dreams. If we take a look at people looking to make better presentation, their hopes is to save time, uh, get some techniques that are easy and simple to implement to design slides faster, to make a memorable impression, and to convince people to do what it is that they want them to do. Fears could be fears of not knowing where to get started, fear of spending too much time on doing this. Dreams could be, you know, closing an A round fund uh, for the startup, close a specific client um, on a presentation. So there's a lot of different variables. And to be successful, try to identify the people you're talking to, what it is that they want. And the third point that's important as well is to understand their level of expertise. So usually there's three types of audiences. Lay, those are people who don't know so much about the topic. You need to educate them. They have basic foundations, but they're not very familiar. Managers are they're kind of people who have information. Um, this information is usually around medium level, but they need more data and more information to eventually take a decision. Experts are people who are very demanding on the content of your presentation, your explanations, and what you'll say, because you have a very good understanding of the topic. So if you can answer those three questions, you're gonna get a better understanding of what it is that your audience wants and how you can craft a message to help them get what they want. A third thing you can be doing is define your goal. When you make a presentation, imagine you're gonna bump into a colleague who say, hey, you have a presentation tomorrow, right? And you're like, yeah, sure, what's the goal? If you can't answer the question, it's probably because you don't really know what's your goal. So a good question you should ask yourself is, why am I making this presentation? If you ask me, today I'm making this presentation to help you acquire you know, specific strategies and techniques that you can inject in your presentations so you can create more impact. That's my goal. Once you have those elements in place, understanding your audience, identifying your audience type, your presentation type, you can craft a message for that audience. A few things you can do uh, include using what I call the three W formula. So this formula is based on things you already know. Who, aka your audience. What, what is that you want to tell them. Why, why would they care. And the way you work on those components, once you have them all gathered together, is you squeeze them up. So you're going to say, I'm making this presentation too, then you're going to use an action verb, which could be help, support, teach, persuade, convince my audience, the things you want to tell them, and why would they care? If we take a look at a specific example here, I'll put two. The first could be my goal is to convince my manager to increase our budget next year so we can roll out new initiatives to acquire a customer. Who? My manager. What do I want him to do? increase my budget. Why would he care? A, because we're going to make more money. Another example, which could be relevant for a startup, show or persuade investors that my startup is getting traction so they feel confident about investing at our next funding round. So this would be a message. It's basically the thing that you want to be telling your audience to captivate their attention. Once you have that message, your goal is to break it down into what I like to call snack-sized bites. So smaller portion that are easy digestible by your audience. You can't just throw information at people's face. You need to break it down methodically so they get it and they get what it is that you want to tell them. So the way you work on this is you take two directions. 
The first is, what is it that you need to tell your audience so you can reach your personal goal? The second thing is, what do you need to tell them to support your core message, which is what you just built before? So if we're taking a look at the presentation I'm making today, my big message is, I wanna teach you actionable reworld strategies and techniques to help you make irresistible presentation. I have three major sub message here. The first one is, there are things you need to do to plan and prepare for a presentation before you design it. The second is, there are some tips you can leverage to make design um, of your slides better. Some are essential, some are more advanced. And the third is, here are some tips you can leverage to be better at public speaking when delivering your presentation. And then the thing that appears to be here in white, um, dark, yellow, no, not yellow, um, light gray, I was looking for this, appears to be a supporting point, which is something that needs to align with my sub message and that needs to be aligned with my big message. Everything is structured this way. There's no place for randomness. The information that needs to be in my presentation needs to be tied with the core message I have for my audience and each single sub message I have as well. If it's not linked to this, I don't want to put it there. Once you have those elements, you need to be thinking about how do I structure actually my presentations. There are existing patterns you can be using. We find this mostly in movies. Uh, if you watch Netflix sometime, you've seen this dozen or hundreds of times, depending on how frequently you do, you do watch it. But basically, um, the first very standard structure is you have an introduction, you have your body, and you have an end. Most presentations fall into that category because it's the standard one. If you want to get more granular, let's say you're making a presentation to a client, a prospect, or an investor, you're going to be focused on, hey, this is a problem you're having, or this is a problem my target customer is having. And then you're going to move them very slowly to the solution that you are offering. In line with the second point, you do also have the what it is slash what it could be, which is based on problem slash an existing situation you're not happy with or your audience is not happy with, and the what it could be, which is the promised land, what it could be if you did X, Y, Z. The other thing that's important is um, that could be used as a presentation that you see a lot in TED Talk presentation is protagonist, which is the main character, usually the person speaking, a conflict they had across a specific problem and the path they took to solve that problem. So your presentation is gonna likely fall into one of those four buckets. Just follow the pattern. You have an intro, tell people what it is that you're gonna cover, cover it in your body, wrap it up at the end, go back to what it is that are the key takeaways, finish the presentation. You're making a pitch to an investor, what problem are you solving? Why should they care? What's your solution? How is it solving that problem? Now we're going to talk about design. So in this section, we'll see basically four, uh, three, three, four things. Um, let's say three for the sake of simplicity. The first thing is we're going to be uh, reviewing very shortly um, copywriting principle, which is basically how do you write in a way that's compelling for your audience? Because presentations sometimes are not you know, presented. You just send them via email, that happens. And also because you need to learn uh, to pretty much write concisely. The second thing is core design principles. We'll be reviewing things like color themes, fonts, images. We'll also review the CRAP principle, which is a principle all graphic designers are swearing by. And finally, we move on to more advanced steps uh, and things you can do to make better slides. Content tips. So this is mostly copywriting, but basically, if you have to remember one thing, copy is communicating one brain, uh, information from one brain to another. It's like communications. And it's the backbone of marketing, and I would even say of business, because you see it pretty much everywhere. You see it in your mail when you get an advertisement. You see it on websites whenever you land on a page. You see it on LinkedIn, on your newsfeed. You see it in restaurant menus trying to push you maybe a more expensive item. So it's pretty much anywhere. Um, this is not a course about copywriting. I'll just give you three tips that you can leverage and apply in your presentations, hopefully useful. And here they are. The first thing that's important is that you need to be extremely specific. 
Um, by specific, I mean paint a picture in your reader's mind. Here I'm giving an example um, of direct sales copywriting. Get a ripped body fast. Yeah, you get it. But what about become the hottest guy on the beach in 60 days? Now, everybody here has an idea of this in their mind. It's very vivid. It's very visual. And that's why it works very well. To be specific, focus on benefits. Focus on numbers. Don't use more words than you need. Don't say he's very happy when you could say he's happy. Use what you need. Work with an eraser in your mind. Based on this first principle, there's a second one that's very important, which is write like you talk. Be short, be concise, be easy to understand. Short sentence, short paragraph. If you're making an extremely technical presentation to a very technical audience, you're kind of excused. You can use words I'm not going to understand. But at the end of the day, try to make it simple. Don't overcomplicate things if you can say them in a simple way. One good trick you could be using is to use the grandma test, which is show a slide to your grandmother or imagine you would show a slide to your grandmother and saying, would she get it? Write in a simple way. Based on that second principle, there's a third one you can keep in mind. Try to keep one idea or concept per slide. In this slide, the concept is, here are three mindsets you can leverage to be better at copywriting. I'm not mixing and matching with a bunch of things. So this is, this is pretty important when you make presentation. Try to focus on one core ID per slide. Design foundation. As I mentioned, we'll review um, colors, we'll review fonts, visuals, and then what I call the crap principle. This is a presentation I made likely, I think it was July on content marketing. If you take a look at it, it's very simple which recurring colors are being used. There's orange, there's gray, there's white. It's simple, so it's easier for you to process it. So whenever you're making a presentation, try to focus on a color theme that you can be using. A few ways to do this is first to leverage the rule of three and use your company colors if you have them. If you have a color palette, a brand identity, use them. First, it increases the brand recognition by up to 80%, which is good for your company. And second, use what you already have. If you don't have this, because you're a student, because you don't have existing colors or for whatever other reason, I've made a link uh, in this presentation to Adobe's color palette. You can mix and match colors based on preference, and it's gonna render you a beautiful design-friendly color palette you can use. Um, and speaking of which, we'll put later at the end of this presentation a link for you to uh, get access to these slides. Now fonts. There's two types of fonts. Like I say, our font friends can be broken down in two categories, basically. There's sans serif. I have no idea whether I'm pronouncing this correctly. And there's serif fonts. Font Psychology 101, the serif ones, they're more readable via print. So keep this in mind if you plan on printing a presentation. They convey elegance and rational. The other one, sans serif, for example, the one I'm using, which is Leto, they're more readable via screens. They convey informality and innovation. So whenever you're making a presentation, think, which category do I want to fall into? For 99% of us, it's sans serif. Based on research, there are a few very legible fonts, and they are Arial, Courier, and Verdana. For people with dyslexia, which is interesting, there's also recurring ones, Helvetica, Courier, Arial, Verdana. So if you don't have an existing font you're using, Arial, Verdana are good uh, choices you can leverage. If you need to get other fonts, I've also linked to resources right below. Visuals. Don't steal images from Google Images. Don't do that. You could have copyright issues. That happens even sometime when getting, uh, giving people credit. The best way to do it is very simple. You go to royalty-free photo website. Just Google royalty-free photo website. You're going to find a bunch of options. Then you can plug in you know, keywords related to the topic of your presentation, and you'll find beautiful visuals. Those ones are from Pexel. And I think I found them when searching for things like business or startups. Now on to the crap principle. So crap principle is a principle that all graphic designers swear by. It stands for contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. 
Um, if there's one thing you need to remember, it's probably this one. So pay attention. The first part of the principle is contrast. Contrast is about making elements, either sizes or colors, to increase people's understanding. The way it works is if it's difficult to read, you're probably not leveraging the contrast principle um, well. So if you take a look at those two slides, the one on the left, yes, it's readable. But is it comfortable? No, it's not. The one on the right is very clear and very easy to read. So whenever you're making a slide, whether that's a cover slide or a body slide, always think, is it easy for people to read it? If you're not sure, you're probably not doing a good job at it. Pop quiz. Which of the slides do you think respect the contrast principle? I'll tell you, there are three. Choice number two, choice number three, choice number five. They're easy to read, the other ones are not. This is a cool trick you can be using whenever you're making a cover slide. I'm seeing this mistake a lot. It's like people put text on a visual that's a bit complicated. The result is it's hard to read. One thing you can do is you integrate a rectangle shape on top of the background. You throw in a bit of uh, opacity or transparency, depending, and you add your text. You still have your visual and it's easier to read. It's something you can do for mostly cover slide and transition slides. Repetition. So this is the second part of the principle. Repetition is about repeating element to create unity in your slide layout. On the left, there's no alignment, no repetition. On the right, there's a clean alignment and there's a repetition between the text and the images to create frequency and consistency. There's the same dimensions in the images. They are in the same virtual boxes, let's say, and it's the same for the text. It creates unity in your slides. Alignment is a third principle of the CREP framework. It's basic, but most of the time I'm not seeing it. If you take a look at the slide, it's aligned here, right, between the headline and the subheadline, and there's it's aligned in the middle. Basically, it's about placing your elements to improve the clarity. Um, whenever you're putting text, try to align on the left because in terms of design, usually people read things with an F pattern. So it starts at the top, goes down and then goes down. So top left, left to right, goes down, left to right, and then go down. So whenever you're seeing the slide on the right, basically people are gonna start here, then move down. So left is better for text in terms of alignment. Another thing you can do is align visuals. So on the left side, there's visual of different dimension and sizes uh, and, and different placement in the image. Try to make them all at the same level it's increasing clarity, it's based on the alignment principle. I just wanted to give you an example with multiple images because sometimes that's something we use. The last part of this principle is proximity. Proximity is basically placing related elements together to convey a sense of closeness. On the slide on the left, uh, basically everything is stacked together. So it's not very clear to understand the purpose of each single element. On the right, there is a clear delimitation between the headline, one phrase, and the next one. It's very clear for the eye. It improves the readability and it improves the clarity. If you take a look at the cover slide I made for this presentation, think which key principles can you spot on this slide? The answer is all of them. There's contrast. So between the dark blue background and the orange, between the dark blue background and the white, the logo. There's repetition with the text, killer presentation, crash course, my name, it's repeated. There's alignment, so there's an alignment on the left here, and there's one on the right here with the logo. And there's proximity because the text killer presentation and the text crash course have the same font size. My name has a lower uh, font size, why? Because I want people to associate the crash course with presentation not crash course with my name because the name is a different category than what the presentation is about. So really important principle, if you're just getting started with design or you think really like suck at design, just leverage this one, create a mental checklist in your head and think every time you're making a presentation, do I respect those principles? A bit more advanced slide design tips. So. I think there's like 14 or 15 tips here. Uh, we'll go over, we'll go over do's and don'ts 
in terms of what it is that you can do to improve the structure and the visual design of your slides. Um, first thing, you can use what I call the HSB formula, headline, subheadline, and body. The way it works is most presentations should have a headline, which is basically a short piece of text that summarizes the content of your slide. Think, if somebody could only have time to see your headlines, would they get your message? And the answer needs to be yes. It needs to be kind of a summary of what your slide is gonna be about. The subheadline, it depends on your type of presentation. I would use them mostly for reports, presentation to board meetings, um, text heavy presentation because sometimes that happens. The goal of it would be to support the headline with more details and to provide context about a statement you made. For example, let's say your headline is sales increased by 25% year on year. Your subheadline could be something in the line of here are three factors that made our sales increase this year, one to three. And then the body would be about explaining in details. So think about a hierarchy about those different aspects. The last part is the body. By body, I refer mostly to text and any supportive visual that you can use to reinforce your headline. Um, here I'm using a screenshot of a sales deck and the goal is to explain this is how things fall into place. You have a headline here, you have a sub headline, and then you have the body which are visuals that strengthen the appeal. So whenever you make a presentation, think at least to have a headline and have body which is the supporting elements of um, your slide. Another thing you can use, it's a very simple trick, but it's important. If you are presenting on a slide that's white in terms of background, use dark gray. It's easier to read. Now you might ask me, yeah, but what about the contrast principle? Wouldn't black be better? It's actually creating too much contrast between black and white. So for the eye, it's a bit more relaxing to have something that's close to black, but not completely black. And if you take a look at my slides, all the text I have that are on white backgrounds are gray. The one I have at the headline is black because the background is gray. It's a simple trick you can use. Most of us use white backgrounds in our presentation, so that's, that's a very low hanging fruit. Another thing that's important, get to the point, use space. The use space recommendation is based on the proximity as well, and the part of the crop principle. And the get to the point is also part of you know, copywriting skills. Every single time you wanna add a piece of information in a presentation, try to be thinking about, is this really conveying value to my audience? Like, is this something that's gonna help them get to the core message quicker? Is it something that can help me reach my goal? Or is this just fluff that's not really necessary? Think, is this a must have or is this a nice to have? And if it's a nice to have, don't put it. Save time, save real estate space on your decks because you don't have much. So really be extremely disciplined about what it is that you put and what it is that you don't put. Another thing you can be doing is using color and weight to create your key on your presentation. You can put bold text. You can change color to highlight specific numbers you want to focus on. For example, numbers about, let's say, the traction you're getting for a product because this is something you want to showcase to investors. It helps people separate what's important from what's not, and it's going to draw their attention and their eye onto the things that matter the most in that specific slide. Um, another thing you can be doing if you're presenting different buckets of information is instead of just writing text, you know, and putting blocks on a slide, you could embed that information into rounded shapes. So um, basically here we're using different colors. Once again, it's this repeat two principle, alignment, they're aligned on the top and on the left. And it repeats the principle also of contrast because there's contrast between the different um, box uh, in that slide. It helps create a little bit of highlights. It helps present information in a less boring way than if you had just put everything with the same colors. So basically what you do is you integrate a shape that's rounded, you change the radius of the edges and you use colors that would be used within your color theme and you're done. Another thing you can do in that same vein is to integrate like color line to shapes. So you have a shape, 
that's on your presentation. You present different services, um, different features, different direction, ideas, whatever that, that is that you present. And on top, you just add a simple line, which could be something like four, four points, five points, depending on your presentation dimension. And you use different colors. It's going to draw the attention onto those different pieces of text. Another thing you can be doing in terms of data visualization is leverage colored shapes to highlight figures. It's something I've seen, I think, on Airbnb's first uh, pitch deck where they were showcasing their traction and they were explaining the numbers they had, especially in terms of night booked and customers and so forth. And it's a very way to draw the attention. If you take a look at the slide on the left, yes, there are numbers, but they have the same size as the rest of the text. Whereas on the right, the font point is much higher. It's a different color for the, for the numbers and they're embedded into colorful shit that immediately draw the attention of the audience. So this is a simple trick you can be using if you need to highlight specific numbers that works well into um, investor pitches, into sales presentation, where you need to explain numbers, for example, to establish credibility. Um, so you can use them. If you like the ones that are on the right slide, same story, I've put a link uh, inside the deck that will send uh, at the end of the presentation. Another thing you can be doing in that same line of presenting specific points and data is to um, introduce stuff inside rounded shape and use icons. Um, if you just check on Google free icons, you'll find a bunch of resources. You can most of the time customize them. It's good if you present services. Um, let's say you have different services. You want to illustrate each one with a different icon. So for you know the customer visualization, it's better. It helps you convey your message. So it's an alternative you have to just presenting information in a just text-based way, let's say. One thing you can be doing, which is pretty cool, is to remove image backgrounds for a better look. Before, if you wanted to do this, you had pretty much two options. One is Photoshop, not everybody's using it, and not everybody should. Um, and the other option you had were to use tools that you can use with PowerPoint and with Keynote with kind of you know limited result in terms of professionalism. This is a great tool you can be using, it's free. It's called remove.bg. Basically, you go to the website, you upload an image, and for, let me tell you, 90% of the case, if the image is not too complex, it's gonna remove the background. It's good enough. What you can do afterwards is, because the background is transparent, play with those images. Below, I'm giving an example of my second slide, where I'm explaining what we're gonna cover. The one on the right looks better. Why? Because I can play and create an overlay on top of, um, on top of the shape where I have my headline. It just looks better than the one on the left, let's be honest. So it's really a great trick you can use for presentation, but for designs you're making for social media. Um, it doesn't work with every type of image, but for some of them, if you want to illustrate a specific point, it's really helpful um, to use it. And it works in like two seconds. If you're making a long presentation like this one, um, whether it's a cell presentation, it's an annual report, whatever it might be, a good thing is to have transition slides. So you can have basic transition slides or you can have transition slides where basically you are guiding people through the deck. Um, if you recall the ones I'm using, whenever I'm moving from part one to part two to part three, I'm highlighting the part that we're covering. Why? Because it helps you understand as a reader as a, and as my audience where we are in your presentation. Um, people need to be guided. We see a lot of presentations all the time. And by highlighting the parts that you're currently covering, you're helping your reader process, okay, we saw this before, we saw this other point before, and now we're seeing the third one. Okay, I get it. So you're just making their life easier, which is, you know, as a presenter, your goal, you want to make sure there's as little friction between the information being conveyed and people's ability to get that information. So it's a good trick you can use to, um, create transition slides. 
something you can use depending once again on your audience, on your presentation type, is emojis. Um, sometimes we see them, there's too much of them. I've heard it a lot. With that being said, if you use them with parsimony, you can leverage them for presenting, introducing points. Instead of bullet points, it can look better. Uh, specify specific points, introduce a sentence. Just It's like everything in life, don't abuse, don't use too much. But uh, it's a pretty cool trick you can be using for body slides and also for uh, cover slides. Here's an example on the right uh, from an online entrepreneur, uh, Peter Levels, which is awesome, but that's another topic. Emojis, use emoji whenever you want or can, depending on your audience. If you happen to be presenting a lot of um, number-driven data, there are things you can do and cannot do to better do it. The first thing you should do is increase the space between the column if you can. Of course, if you have hundreds of columns, then you're kind of screwed, right? But this is a principle of you know having better uh, stability for people. It's easier for them mm -hmm. to process the information and they don't have to mentally separate one column from another one. There are three principles you can leverage as well, which is all numbers needs to be aligned on the right. Whenever you present number on a table, align them on the right. If you're presenting text, align it on the left. For the headers of those table, they need to be aligned with your data. So if you're presenting text, the header is aligned on the left. If you're presenting data, it's aligned on the right. Basic three-point rule, use it whenever you present tables because it's how it should be done. Another thing you can be doing is um, try to be curious. We spend a lot of time browsing on internet, checking website, web pages, stuff on social media. Whenever you see something you like in terms of you know, user experience, elements layout, see, okay, what did I like about it? What are the patterns I can identify and eventually use to create a slides that get inspired from it? On the left side, I have, I think it's a screenshot from a company's job page or something like this. And I really liked the fact, you know, it's a very light gray background. There are shapes which are rounded, but with a very small radius. The text is aligned in the middle. There's an emoji at the top, it's centered. So right here, what I'm doing is I, I'm breaking down the core component of this uh, web page. And because I have those components, if I wanted to create a slide around, you know, let's say I'm a marketing agency and there are four things I offer for clients like website audits, gross marketing, copywriting, conversion, I could be using a similar pattern and, you know, include um, rectangle or rounded shapes, throw in a little bit of shadow, use icons, put the text in bold at the top, then put my text. So try to reverse engineer things you like if you have uh, the time to do so and see how you could leverage those elements for your success uh, in your presentations. In that same vein, there's something you can be doing is to create your own swipe file. So a swipe file is basically a folder that you keep on your desktop or that you keep on your phone, depending. And every time you see something you like, either it's a great ad, great copy on LinkedIn, a great visual, you just add it to that swipe file. And the way it works is whenever you need inspiration or you want to have some ideas, you can check it out. This is mine. So I have a bunch of stuff about pages, ads, books. And whenever I see something I like and I'm like, that was good, even an email, I just screenshot it and I put it there. And whenever I need some inspiration, I head to that folder and I get a bunch of ideas. You can do the same with the previous tip I mentioned. With that being said, we're going to be moving on to delivering presentation. Inside that section, we're gonna go over some basic stuff you can do for uh, optimizing in an online context. Most of us now are working remotely, so it means we're not presenting to real people, we're presenting to screens, which has some limitations. So I'll share three things you can do to improve um, delivery in an online context. And then we'll go over some basic public speaking skills. Um, of course, keeping in mind that there's a lot of things we cannot do because we're in front of a screen and um, ways to introduce a presentation and um, a bit more. And we'll wrap up with this afterwards. 
Remote office setup basics. Um, this is not mandatory, but if you do happen to present a lot to prospects, to clients, to investors, it's probably not the nice to have, it's a must have. There are three things you need to be doing. First, you need a good camera. You need people to very uh, well visualize your face. You need good resolution. It's like having a crappy image with low resolution and one with a very high resolution. It's all the difference. So it's the same if you're presenting and you need to use your video uh, all the time. Good camera. Second thing, good microphone. If people can't hear you well, you're going to create a barrier between them hearing what you say and them understanding what you say. The third thing is lighting. Good rule, the cheap way is to try to be um, not very far away from a window or make sure at least there's no shadow on your face. So there's a uniformity in between you and your background. The paid way is to have a light that you just put behind your screen that is gonna reflect light on you and you're gonna shine in all sense of the words. Um, you can find those in Amazon just type in stuff, stuff like remote office uh, setup. If you make a lot of presentation to, let's say, high stake audience, it's really recommended for you to, you know, invest in yourself and equip yourself with the right materials um, to properly help you communicate your message across. Public speaking tips. Um, this is pretty fun. This. Um, is from a movie called The King's Speech. Some of you might have seen it, but basically it's about, this tip is about using tongue twisters to warm up before doing a presentation. So. I'm a thistle sifter. I have a sieve of sifted thistles and a sieve of unsifted thistles because I'm a thistle sifter. So this is basically how it works. It looks hard, it is hard. The way you do this is simple. You head over to Google and you just put tongue twisters. Use a different list, you pick one you like, and before a presentation, you start saying those words. The point is to try to get as fast as possible, but gradually. They're a good way for you to train those muscles and to practice speaking clearly and in a shit properly, because whether you're a native English speaker or you're not, the best way to communicate information is to get people to understand what you say. And I can tell you the number of people that even you probably sometime hear, and you're like, I don't get what they're saying. They're mumbling. So try to speak clearly and in a shit properly. This is a very good trick to get started. You know, do it five minutes before your presentation and it's really gonna warm you up. The second thing, which is related to starting um, properly a presentation, like trying to catch people attention is to start with a story. So it doesn't work for everybody in every context. It really depends on who your audience is and what the type of presentation you're doing and so forth, what we saw in the foundation uh, section. But one thing that is important is that stories usually get remembered up to 22 times more than facts alone. So stories have a very strong stickiness power. And if you use them the right way, they're going to help you grab the attention of your audience right off the bat. And there's four things you can be doing to make a great story. The first thing you need to ask yourself is, why am I telling that story in the first place? This is based on relevancy. You need to make sure that what you're going to say to your audience makes sense in the context of your presentation, in the topics that are going to be covered, in the type of audience that you're facing. It needs to make sense. Otherwise, it's just gonna look weird and you're gonna look weird, right? The second thing is, is this helping me grab the attention of the audience? So why would they wanna listen to that story? This is also related to your goal, it's relevance. Like, is this relevant? Does it make sense in that context to take that specific story? The third thing is engage. Would they care about that story? Would they feel connected to it? Is it talking to specific problems they have? Are you telling the story, for instance, of a previous client who was you know, struggling with something and they found a solution? Is it something that could resonate with a prospect because you know they have a similar problem? Um, and the third thing is, would that story in the best word want to be shared? Is it something you'd be like, oh my God, I want to share this because it's kind of crazy. In an ideal world, you get an answer 
of yes to all this question. It's not going to happen all the time, but those are kind of characteristic and guidelines that you can be using to make a story sticky and effective. There's another thing you can be doing when you make a presentation is integrate statistics and quotes in your opener. Um, I didn't do it for a presentation today, but I could have started saying, hey, did you know that it takes seven people, seven seconds to people to know whether they like you when you get started doing a presentation and just 30 seconds to decide whether they want to listen to you? I could have started this way. It would have been a good opener um, to hook you up and be like, oh, that's an interesting stat. I didn't know it. Um, starting with stats is good because it evokes curiosity. People are interested. We like numbers. We like facts, even if they don't stick as well. And a few things you can do is basically head over to Google and try different search strings. So if you're looking for research data, a good way to get started is to put site.udo. Um, this is going to render all websites that are educational websites. So website from university, educational resources, online publications. Then you put a keyword and then you put data. This is gonna render your results from those type of websites. Another thing you can be doing is to put in your URL research keyword statistics. You could find reports on that specific topic. You can also put your keyword expert quotes if you wanna start off with a quote. So there are, those are search strings you can be using if you wanted to get started with statistics around a presentation. Another thing you can do once you've, you know, introduced your um, topic with either a quote, either a story, an introduction about yourself, we'll check this right after, is use the GTS formula. Give them something. You need to get your audience excited about what they'll be able to do by the end of your speech. When we started, we said, today you're going to get actionable strategies and technique you can leverage to make a resistible presentation. I'm making a promise. Hopefully I keep it. But the point is to lure you into, this is what you're going to be able to do once you finish the presentation. I'm making a promise, which is here to captivate your attention and to help you understand what's the value in that presentation for you. So whenever you make a presentation, try to be focused on what it is that you give your audience. Even a sales presentation, you can say to people, by the end of that presentation, you'll have a very clear understanding of whether our SaaS solution product is a good fit for you. You're making a promise. You're going to explain your benefits and your features. And by the end, they will have enough information to take a decision. Another way is if you need to introduce yourself, for example, in an environment where people don't know you, you're making a speech, you need to introduce yourself. You need to think that three things are important to people. The first one is they want to be free, second, happy, third, successful. So try to tie whatever it is that you're saying to one of those three. When I mention presentation, I'm going to make you successful because creating a resistible presentation is something people care about, right? So those are different phrases you could use. You know how people have a specific problem? Well, I offer a specific solution. We help a specific audience with a specific problem they have so they can get a result they want. Um, to give you an example, you could be saying, hey, I help entrepreneurs get a competitive advantage by delivering irresistible pitches that sell their ideas and make an amazing impression. When you make a presentation after you introduce yourself, started with a quote, a powerful opener, a story, is to share a plan. I mentioned this when I mentioned the transition slides, but a plan makes it easy for people to follow through. Tell them, this is what we're gonna cover today. It ties to your promise. You promise something to people, tell them what it is that you're gonna tell them to reach that promise. Go over the specifics, use a table of content, put some bullet point A, guys, those are the three things we're gonna cover today. Give a little bit of specifics, give teasers. When I mentioned, in the even bright description, you're going to learn the 3W formula. People are like, 3W, what is it? I'm triggering your curiosity. It's something you can do. Just make sure don't clickbait people. Don't lie to them. If you promise something, deliver it to them. Those are mostly uh, posture, verbal expression skills. 
it's a bit harder when you're in front of a camera, but try not to be presenting like this, like you're rolling up in pain. Use expression of the nature of dominance. Open up, put your shoulder back, show that you are uh, comfortable with your topic, that you're confident. The good news in using high pauses uh, of power is that they decrease your cortisol by 25%. Cortisol is a stress hormone. It makes us stressed. So by using pauses where you roll up your shoulder back, you're decreasing your stress level. So it makes you look good and it makes you feel good. Use it. Uh, another thing, it also increases your testosterone. So you're going to feel and act more confident whenever you use pauses where you are opening up to people. So it's a short trick. Whenever you have to present, try to recall it. If you don't, just put a sticker on the side of your screen to do it. Eliminate filler words. All of us are using them. Um, well, like, mm, they make us look dumb, unprepared. We can't eliminate them 100% for sure, but there's three things you can do to make sure you reduce them drastically. The first thing is video or audio record yourself to find out how really, how bad it is. Because we don't listen to ourselves where we talk, we're focused on our content, we focus on our audience. So we don't really know. If you need to make a presentation, you know, record yourself five, 10 minutes, listen to it. How bad is it? Maybe it's worse than you saw it and maybe it's better, but you can't fix it unless you're aware of it. The second thing you can do is try to be silent when you're looking for the right word. Instead of just mumbling around, like what I did earlier when I was looking for the right color and I said yellow instead of light gray, try to be silent because it helps you keep and save time to find what it is that you want to be saying to your audience. The last thing you can be saying is basically you pause, you think, and then you answer. The most important is definitely record yourself to find out how it is. I can't tell you the number of people who are in even C-level you know, positions in a company. Their presentation skills are terrible, but they're probably not aware of it. So if they would record themselves and see how it is, they would like, like, you know, reality shock. And I'm sure it would improve drastically how it is that they present and speak uh, to their audience. In that same vein, try to use pauses and expressions um, to add expressions and feelings to your presentation. Because when you pause, you let the information you're saying sink in. You help people understand that you're making a transition. When I'm pausing between two slides, whenever I try to do it, it helps you understand and digest the content of the presentation. So you can do it when you change of concept, when you highlight an important concept, and when you are basically making a transition. It's not easy. Uh, I'm the first one to have a problem with this. I'm French. We speak French extremely fast most of the time. People are like, oh my God, how can you speak so fast? Well, listen to our Spanish friend first. But anyway, that's another story. It's hard sometimes for us to speak slowly. But when doing public speaking, it's really your best ally because it helps you save time and it helps you find the right, correct words when, you know, talking to people. Another thing you can do is use a conversation, conversational tone. So use the word I and you. You don't have to say I, you can say we if you're speaking on behalf of your company. You know that feeling, we help you get this. You know this, we. You're creating a conversation with people and this is helping you increase engagement because if it's only about you or if it's only about them, at some point it's gonna look weird. So try to use those different words to create more engagement within your audience. A way to end well is to wrap up what it is that you said, go back to your promise, tell people this is what you've learned today, give them eventually a call to action. What I want you to do when you leave the presentation is X, Y, Z, and include guidance on what to do next. Uh, this is important to reframe and, and re-insist on your message uh, and tell them what you told them and tell them once more. Let's 
wrap things up. We're four minutes before the end time. So I think I'm pretty much on time here. Um, hopefully I didn't speak too fast, but if there's three things you need to remember for that presentation, because there's so many things you could be remembering, those are the ones. Whenever you're making a presentation, lay down your foundations before starting. Don't get, oh, I'm gonna design first. Think, what is your goal? Who are you talking to and what are the key characteristics? What is your presentation type? What is the one thing that you want people to remember? And how are you gonna make sure you break, break down that message into all the components of your presentation? The second thing that's important is to craft principle. That depends, of course, of your, of your level. Some people are like, oh, I already know that. I didn't learn anything. But for most of us, if we could just make sure to apply religiously that principle of contrast, of repetition, alignment, and proximity all through the slides that we're making, it's going to look like you know 80% uh, better than most of people who are making presentations. When you're speaking to people, even through a screen, when it's remote and a bit weird, try to open up try to have a good light on you um, try to make sure people can hear you well use hypo or pause to look and feel confident and most importantly don't rush try to speak slowly try to make sure that you're not just rushing it because it's going to help you tremendously when you're presenting information if you want to get those slides along with a resource to get templates you can head over to that address Manny is gonna put it in the chat comments below. Um, you will get access to that presentation uh, if you wanna review a few concepts later on. Uh, I hope you liked it. If you have questions, you can you know, send me a message on uh, LinkedIn, uh, a few other things that uh, you might wanna be doing if you are interested. You know, If you're a startup and you're looking for a workspace, we offer all-inclusive workspace membership to tech startups in our uh, co-working space here in SF, we help startups, you know, grow. We help them connect with mentors and with experts to help them grow their business. We also offer virtual office memberships. Uh, so you don't need to be in SF. You could just come sometimes. We offer you access to business address in SF. And um, if you work at a larger organization, we do um, help global companies, you know, like uh, Fujitsu, like Emirates, like IBM, to basically navigate the trends that are affecting their business. and leverage relationship with startups to, let's say, future-proof their business. So if you're interested in seeing how we could help you, you know, boost your innovation efforts, head over to that URL, contact us. We'd love to talk to you.